Well, thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Thanks to all the listeners for joining, and thanks to Dr. Cavanaugh and the Health Watch USA organization for inviting me to speak tonight. It's a real honor to be able to share some of our work today. My name is Jason Praterelli. I'm a fourth-year medical student at the University of Michigan. I'm currently doing a one-year master's program where I work as a research fellow at the Center for Healthcare Outcomes and Policy. I have no conflicts of interest. My only disclosure is what I just admitted about my stage of training. Although I'm not credentialed and I don't have privileges to use the DaVinci robot myself, the themes that emerge from this talk are topics that I'm very interested and very passionate about and I've been fortunate to be able to study and write about over this past year. So tonight I want to address an important patient safety issue, but I also want to spend some time talking about tangible ways that we might improve this. So we'll start by discussing the prevalence and impact that innovations can have on patient care. We'll review a prominent legal case, Taylor v. Intuitive, to help us understand the roles of physicians and hospitals in ensuring the safe introduction for new technology in practice. We'll review the existing guidance and recognize limitations in the guidelines for hospitals to credential and privilege their physicians to use new technology. And then it's my goal that we'll consider new approaches to improve the processes of hospital credentialing and also the training of practicing physicians to safely use new technology and procedures. Although much of today's talk uses the example of robotic surgery, this conversation really applies to all physicians who offer services that involve procedures and new technologies. Medical and surgical innovations are regularly introduced into clinical practice. Whether it's cardiac stents or endoscopic and laparoscopic technology, many of these innovations have proven to have substantial benefits for patient care. When new technology enters practice, though, it's often unclear who's actually responsible for ensuring its safe introduction. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has tight regulatory control over new drugs. However, it exerts less oversight for new devices and no oversight for new procedural techniques. When implementing new technologies, physicians are guided by their general sense of professionalism and the potential risk of medical malpractice. Similarly, hospitals also share the medical legal risks when they choose to credential physicians or confirm the qualifications of licensed physicians and by granting them privileges or authorizing those physicians for specific patient care services. One of the most visible innovations that's presented to physicians in hospitals has been the DaVinci Surgical System. The company that makes this technology is called Intuitive Surgical. In 2000, the DaVinci robot was initially approved for use in general laparoscopic surgery procedures. Fundamentally, robotic surgery is just an extension of technology that already exists in laparoscopic surgery. It involves many of the same principles, such as insertion of ports and insufflation of the abdomen for minimally invasive access. It also has many of the same indications and contraindications. But robotic surgery aims to get around some of the limitations of laparoscopy, such as improving the ability to articulate instruments inside the body cavity by using robotic wrists. Despite little evidence at first, robotic surgery was touted to have many benefits. It was initially advertised that patients would experience less pain with shorter recovery time, Surgeons would benefit from improved dexterity and less fatigue from sitting at the console compared to standing during open and laparoscopic procedures, and hospitals would save money from shorter lengths of stay. Dissemination of this technology was rapid since its introduction, as it spread across general surgery, urology, gynecology, and other disciplines. This graph shows trends of use for the DaVinci robot. Last year, over half a million robotic surgeries were performed worldwide. Over 2,000 robotic systems have been installed in the United States alone. Adoption was quickest in the early 2000s for urology, mainly for use with prostate surgery. Gynecology and general surgery are fields where the use of the robot has been expanding more recently. Its widespread adoption has been partially attributed to aggressive marketing tactics, which increased demand from patients and invoked fascination from physicians and hospitals. To date, though, there has not been a standard method for how people adopt this new technology. In recent years, controversy has arisen when device manufacturers go beyond their traditional role, that is to reasonably design and manufacture a device, and participate in the training and credentialing of physicians to use their company's product. A recent legal ruling in the lawsuits against Intuitive, the company that makes the DaVinci robot, sheds light on the question of who is responsible for ensuring the safe introduction of new technology. My mentors and I recently published a viewpoint in JAMA describing the case of Taylor v. Intuitive the first of at least 26 lawsuits against Intuitive alleging patient injuries or death tied to the DaVinci surgical system. This has been the only case to date that has reached trial. 
This story first generated national attention when it was covered by the New York Times in 2013. This is a photo that the Times took of the wife of the patient that was the focus of this case. The patient was a 67-year-old, obese but relatively healthy man who underwent a robot-assisted radical prostatectomy that was supposed to last two to three hours. Unfortunately, the case became complicated, was delayed in converting to the open procedure, and lasted for nearly 12 hours long. The patient suffered a collection of complications that landed him in the intensive care unit for four months afterwards. He had a rectal laceration, which led to sepsis, reoperation, and colostomy formation. And in the ICU, he suffered acute lung and kidney failure, stroke, and permanent incontinence. The lawsuit was initially filed because of the severe limitations in the patient's postoperative functional status. The plaintiffs also argued that this debility accelerated his heart disease and eventually led to his death four years later at age 71. The surgeon in this case was a board-certified practicing urologist who had performed over 100 open prostatectomies with good outcomes over a decade in practice. A novice in robotic surgery, though, he underwent preparatory training that was designed by Intuitive. He spent one day of hands-on training at company headquarters in Sunnyvale, California, and then he was proctored on two robotics cases by a more experienced surgeon. The hospital itself had little experience with robotic surgery. In fact, the case documents report that the hospital's newly formed robotics committee based its credentialing requirements solely on Intuitive's training program. The tricky part here is that three consultants from Intuitive also sat on the hospital's robotics committee. So in effect, this case was the surgeon's third operation using the robot on a patient, and it was his first without supervision as the attending surgeon. Acknowledging their failure to maintain patient safety, the surgeon, his private practice, and the hospital all settled individual malpractice lawsuits out of court. However, Intuitive did not settle and instead took this case to trial, and that this case could have major implications for Intuitive, and for all device manufacturers for that matter, in establishing a precedent for companies' responsibilities when patients have bad outcomes using their company's products. In this 2013 trial, the plaintiff's attorneys argued that Intuitive failed to provide the doctor with sufficient training and oversight to use the Da Vinci robot. They also alleged that the company failed to adequately warn the doctor about the risks, contraindications, and decision-making involved with using this device. However, a Washington state jury ruled in favor of the defense. In this important case, negligence was not attributed to Intuitive, the maker of an innovative device that, when improperly used, led to the debilitating injuries and eventual death of a patient. The plaintiffs have since filed an appeal challenging the legal proceedings of this case, such as certain evidence that the jury was allowed or was not allowed to consider. The appellate court heard the oral arguments in January of this year, and a decision is not expected to come out until sometime this summer. During this appeals process that is still underway, facts may emerge that could reverse the initial trial court's decision. In particular, other courts might rule differently based on intuitive level of involvement with the hospital's credentialing process. But this initial trial court ruling implies that the medical legal responsibility for training, credentialing, and privileging physicians to use new technologies belongs to physicians and the hospitals where they work. Now, normally, device manufacturers can be held responsible when their product is defective or malfunctions. But in this case and in many others, the device worked properly. The problem lies in the training and credentialing of doctors to use the product. So turning to authorities for guidance on this matter, the Joint Commission's Standards for Hospitals state that a hospital's organized medical staff is responsible for credentialing and privileging all licensed independent practitioners. Currently, at least 25 states recognize negligent credentialing as a valid malpractice claim against hospitals. So hospitals continue to bear joint responsibility for medical malpractice that results from poor credentialing and privileging processes. So with this charge from the Joint Commission, what guidance exists for hospitals to design their own credentialing standards? The more fundamental question that we're trying to answer is, how can physicians and hospitals safely introduce new technology and procedures? I'll argue that there's two main strategies for answering this question. We'll review the existing guidance for hospital credentialing and privileging, and then we'll talk about how it can be improved. Several specialty organizations have produced guidelines for hospitals to use robotic surgery. The few that exist are generally in agreement. Unfortunately, none are very specific or rigorous. For practicing surgeons who have not had formal training in robotic surgery during residency or fellowship, they recommend the following minimum requirements. A structured training curriculum 
That involves a didactic educational component as well as a hands-on skills training portion. And then some form of real-life clinical experience, either personal experience performing another similarly complex operation or proctoring by an expert surgeon. However, this is what we saw with the urologist in Taylorverse Intuitive. Technically, the doctor met these minimum criteria, although one day of training was probably not enough, and he was only minimally proctored before being set off on his own. What we really want to know is, how can we tell when physicians are competent to use a new technology? I want to emphasize one aspect of these guidelines that was particularly underutilized in the Taylorverse Intuitive case, and that may be an immediate way for hospitals to address this dilemma, and that's proctoring. In these guidelines, a proctor is an expert physician who acts as an extension of the credentialing committee to observe, evaluate, and report back to the hospital with an assessment of the practicing physician's competence using the new technology. But for hospitals that want to grant privileges to physicians who are competent using new procedural skills, ensuring adequate training beyond residency or fellowship is a major challenge. Using this story as a representative case, clearly there are weaknesses in the ways that we have to train practicing physicians to use innovative technology. I want to make the case for improving the credentialing process by finding better ways to train practicing physicians and to assess their competency with new procedures. The current methods that we have for training practicing physicians really fall short of the target. Weekend courses or one-day courses, as in the case of Taylor vs. Intuitive, are simply not enough. Cadaver labs, simulations, and certificate programs are mainly aimed at basic tasks and are unlikely to meet hospitals' needs in credentialing physicians for complex new procedures. Many fellowships are a little better, being week-long to month-long training programs, but these require a sizable time commitment and can be costly. What's more is that even these programs don't really assess a physician's competency using the new technology. Traditionally, procedural competency has been measured by board certification and sufficient experience. Essentially, we assume that if you've been around long enough and done enough cases, you really can't help but to be good at the procedure. But really, provider experience is only a surrogate measure of what we actually want to know, which is when is a provider competent to use a new procedure. This is what we need to get better at. New research may indicate ways that could completely transform how hospitals credential physicians for procedural services and better ensure patient safety. In particular, directly measuring operative proficiency would offer a new approach for physicians and hospitals to assess this elusive concept of competency with new procedures. This high-profile study using data from the Michigan Bariatric Surgery Collaborative sought to specifically measure surgeons' technical skills and to compare that with patient outcomes after weight loss surgery. In this study, 20 bariatric surgeons submitted an operative videotape of them performing laparoscopic gastric bypass. Each video was then peer rated by at least 10 surgical colleagues using a standardized instrument for rating certain aspects of technical skill. Surgeons were then grouped into three categories based on their skill level, bottom, middle, and top performers. The results of this study were that the surgeons who looked like they were better on video actually had better outcomes for their patients. These results were huge because it showed that operative proficiency can actually be measured using video-based analysis. This could radically change the way that credentialing bodies determine if a physician is good enough to use a new technology on patients. So we can use these videos to identify the good surgeons, but how can we make the lesser skilled surgeons better? Or how can we speed up the learning curve for practicing physicians who are just learning new procedures? One new answer to that is coaching. Coaching in medicine and surgery became popularized when Atul Gawande wrote this article in The New Yorker in 2011. He described how top athletes and talented musicians had coaches throughout their professional careers. and He explained his experience using a coach with him in the operating room. But can coaching actually work? There's actually little empirical evidence to date in medicine or surgery. Most of the literature on coaching is in the business and education fields. For example, one study looked at interventions to get teachers to implement a new instructional skill in the classroom for their students. They saw that at a workshop, verbal description of the skill resulted in 10% of teachers adopting it. When feedback was added, 19% of the teachers adopted the new skill. When peer coaching was added as a follow-up intervention, 95% of teachers transferred the new skills to their classrooms. So what exactly does coaching look like in a medical context? Although being at Michigan, it pains us to credit other Big Ten rivals, Caprice Greenberg, 
breast cancer surgeon at the University of Wisconsin, came up with a pretty cool coaching concept with the Wisconsin Surgical Coaching Framework. She described that coaching can be used to target improvements in surgeons' technical, cognitive, and interpersonal skills. So now we're trying to take these theoretical concepts of coaching and actually put them into practice to try to make bariatric surgeons in Michigan better. My research mentor at Michigan, Justin Dimmick, is leading a research grant to design and implement a coaching intervention for weight loss surgery. The goals of this project are to measure the effects of coaching on peer ratings of technical skill and ultimately to measure the impact of coaching on actual patient outcomes. The first step is to select coaches from among the top skill performers and then the coaches will be trained in skills such as giving feedback in a positive manner. Now's a good time to point out that Jim Harbaugh is not involved with this coaching project. But imagine how this concept could apply to any medical field that involves procedural skills and new technology where patients are at risk of injury. Where this project is currently at is that coaches have been selected and were trained earlier this year. This summer, coaches will be paired up with surgeons, and in the coming years, it should be exciting to see the results of this trial. But coming back to our original question of how can physicians and hospitals safely introduce new technology into practice, this study is combining the two approaches we just discussed. One, measuring technical skill may allow us to tell exactly when practicing physicians are good enough to use new procedures safely. That is, it tests a real measure of procedural competency. Two, for those who are not yet ready to use the new technology, coaching can be used for performance improvement. These provide new ways to improve patient safety through both the hospital credentialing and also the training process for practicing physicians. And with that, we've come full circle. Today, we saw that medical and surgical innovations can have major impacts on patient care. Through the case of Taylor vs. Intuitive, we learned that physicians and hospitals are ultimately responsible for introducing technology and procedures safely into practice. The guidelines that exist for hospital credentialing are limited, but they provide a place to start. In particular, proctoring is often underutilized and could help hospitals immediately with this process. New research is exciting as it may transform the way that hospitals credential and that practicing physicians can learn new procedural skills. Video-based skill measurement can be used to assess actual procedural competency, and coaching can be used for performance improvement. At this time, I'd like to thank my mentors, Dr. Justin Dimmick and Dr. Skip Campbell. And I want to thank one more time Dr. Kavanaugh and the HealthWatch USA organization for inviting me to speak tonight. Thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take questions.